everybody, welcome. Here we are with the Lethbridge Historical Society on our walking tour of the Warehouse District. Hopefully some of you are watching us online. As always, if you have questions, please make sure you put them on. We'll try to keep an eye on the page as we go through as well. Of course, this is a Lethbridge Historical Society tour. My name is Belinda Croson. I'm with the Lethbridge Historical Society. We have a couple of members of our society here today, um, but of course, because of the situation right now, we're going to try to keep this as virtual as possible. If you are a paid up Lethbridge Historic Society member, so we love all of you who follow us on Facebook, but this is our members who are actually paid to be a member. If you make a comment on the uh, tour this afternoon or this evening, your name will be submitted to be entered for a gift card for a local Lethbridge business. So make sure, we let, make sure you let us know that you are out there and we will of course include you in the draw. So here we are in the Warehouse District. So we are downtown right now on 2nd Avenue and 13th Street North. Or 13th Street South, maybe if I got myself ready. The part of our city committee has extended their boundaries now to cover this area and 13th Street North as well. So that this means this area might be at some point ready to have plaques put up. So it's one of the reasons we've been researching into this area to get to know this area better because there's some fascinating stories here but also be prepared if we get a request, a historic site gets a request for, we want a plaque on this building at some point, we want to have the research ready. So part of this tonight, we'll be showcasing the research we've already done, but as always, we'll be looking for more research. So if you have stories to share, if you had a store down here at some point, if you came shopping down here at some point, please share those stories because we want to include as much as possible in our research book as we go along. So as you heard me already say, we're in the warehouse district. This has been known as a warehouse district, as the Wholesale Warehouse District, for well over 100 years. Around 1909-1912, this area developed as the major warehouse and wholesale district of Lethbridge. The area would extend further east, so east of 13th Street after the Second World War. We are going to be working here on west of 13th Street for tonight's tour, so we're going to be looking at the older part of the district. We are doing research and we'll do another tour another time for the area on the other side of 13th Street North. Warehouse districts, wholesale districts are where businesses that bought in bulk and sold to resellers were located. In Lethbridge, this is also the area where the implement dealers and the agriculture dealers are located. And as we go through, they just started up one of the machines at Ellison, so hopefully you can still hear me. As we go through, where some of the earliest automobile, automobile sellers were located. In earlier Lethbridge, so if we go back before 1909, some of the original warehouses were actually west of downtown in the 4th Street South area around 2nd Avenue, 1st Avenue. As that area filled up around 1909, as I said earlier, they looked to this area. This area was also close to the rail yard, which would have been just one block north of us. And there were spur lines throughout this area connecting up to the rail line because quite often they brought in car loads, so train car loads of products to fill the warehouse. The traditional role of the warehouse district has been replaced today by the more modern industrial parks. And as we talk about some of the businesses that used to be located here, you'll hear that theme quite often. They then moved to the industrial park, they then moved to the industrial park for a lot of these. And so the old purpose of this area has changed into what you see today. But across North America, these old warehouse districts are being developed into unique neighborhoods. And that's what is planned for, expected, hoped for here in Lethbridge, that some of the stories we're telling will become part of that new neighborhood development. So we want to not only tonight think about the history of the warehouse district, but about its possible future. So we're starting with Ellison Mills, which is just behind us. Ellison Milling and Elevator Limited started at Raymond in 1902 when a 150 barrel flour mill was built in that community. The Raymond Mill was soon followed by one in McGrath and then this one here in Lethbridge. When the mill was first started in Raymond, the conventional wisdom at that time was that it was going to fail. The general opinion was, back there in the early 1900s, that there wasn't enough good milling wheat grown in this country to operate the mills and that there are also no markets for the products could, that could be found after the flour was milled. The company, of course, certainly proved that wrong. The rapid expansion of the area just prior to the First World War 
with a population growth, with many new towns being developed, many new farms and many new farmers coming into the area, completely changed that old conventional wisdom. And it helped the company survive. Another thing that helped Ellison survive in the early days was the agreement made between Ellison Milling and the city of Lethbridge. We know that that agreement was actually bylaw 221. In August 1906, bylaw 221 went to a plebiscite, which was approved by the public. And as the Herald noted, the people stood by a progressive policy that bylaw passed 106 for 28 against. So what was bylaw 221 and how did it help the development of Ellison Mill? Well, in that bylaw, in exchange for a promise to build the flour mill, which they did on this site, they had to agree that that flour mill would have a capacity equal to the one in Raymond of 150 barrels during every 24 hours. If they would achieve that, the company would receive water at a prescribed rate and did not have to pay taxes for 15 years. If during those 15 years the company expanded their facility to produce 500 barrels of flour in every 24 hours, the tax exemption would be, in, in, would be extended for five years. And as we go through the story, we'll find if they did that. So Ellison Mills was built with a 20-year tax exemption and water rates at a very certain and cheaper level than if they had been buying it without the bylaw. We know that that agreement was passed in 1906 and a tender for the building, building material was advertised in February 1907. I'm always amazed when we look at some of those buildings that they were putting up in the pre-World War I period, how quickly that they were able to get operational. So the tender for the building material went out in February 1907. The mill was operational by August of that year. It was reported in August 1907 that as soon as the mill started working nights, 20 men would be employed. And in August 1907, the first flower came out of the Ellison Mill. We know who bought that very first bag of flour. It was actually Exstorm who owned the Dallas Hotel. So we imagine, we know he bought it, he bought it for the hotel, that in August 1907, you could have had the first food based, made from the first pack of flour from Ellison if you'd been staying at the Hotel Dallas down there on Fifth Street South. Now, of course, the old wooden building that went up here in 1907 has been changed over the years. Some of the changes are obvious. In 1929, a concrete elevator was built with a capacity of 60,000 bushels. Now, I want you to imagine flour mills, and there were a couple in this area. Columbia Mills was just a little north of us. Taylor Mills, which was incorporated into Ellison's eventually, was just a little east of Ellison's. And so, one of the things that they had to worry about was actually fire and a few other things. Now, when they built the concrete mill, the concrete factory in 1929. Fire was a concern. And you might wonder why they felt the need to expand so much in 1929. It was noted that the introduction of the combine and the use of motor trucks so they could bring wheat from a further distance was behind the expansion. That new elevator not only was making flour but was also a cleaning department for cleaning seeds. However, the imposing site of that, or the imposing, wow, I can't always speak today. The imposing height of that 1929 building meant something else. It meant that it was a very tall building, and so a beacon light was actually placed at the top of that 1929 elevator, which was important because the airport was just a little further north and a little further east at Fifth Avenue and Merrimagrath Drive south today. The beacon that they placed on top of the elevator could be seen from 30 miles around. As I mentioned, they built a concrete um, part of the building for fire concerns, but they were also further concerned about fire, and in 1935 an automatic sprinkler system was installed in Ellison. It was connected with the alarm system of the city fire department. Growth and changes of course continued, as we noted that they took over the area of Taylor Mills, and they moved a little bit further east in their expansion. In 1975, the ownership of the company changes as well, and the company was sold to Parrish and Heimbecker. They continued under the Ellison's name, and in 1998 it was noted that Ellison's was actually a swing mill. Still may, uh, continuing to mill three different types of wheat, though other mills in North America only milled one type of wheat. This, of course, is a very abbreviated history of Ellison's. We have a lot of other buildings to get around to today. And we know, as I said, Taylor Mills and Columbia Mills were also in this area. Uh, as we go into the history that we're putting together on the warehouse district, we will of course go more into the Ellison family and the Green family that was actively involved. 
but we'll have to tell you those stories on another time. We're going to continue our walk west and go find out about a building whose construction date we still don't know, even though we know the use of the building over the years. So we're going to walk just a walk further west. Not so far. You got a compliment from Kelty about your top. Hmm? You got a compliment from Kelty about your top. <laughs> and I was watching or listening to the recording on my phone and it sounded okay. I think those of you who are watching online know that this is usually where we can have a bit of a talk and people can ask questions. So once again, if you do have questions, make sure you post them on the page. We will try to answer them if we can. If I have to wait till I get home back to my research books, I'll answer it back then when we have an opportunity. So we're going to go to the corner here now of the next street, and we'll talk about the two buildings across the street from each other. And Kelsey says the sound sounds great. Okay. Obviously, they're picking up on this one. Everybody on the tour is trying to get out of the image. Sometimes it's not easy to try to get the exact date of construction for some of the buildings in this area because some of the research we're doing on the warehouse district is some of the first research that's been done. And unlike some of the houses which have earlier surveys and we have the tax records and things, we're still trying to piece together some of the history of the building. And so this is actually one of the buildings that we haven't got the exact date of construction um, because of various reasons. And this is one of the fun things. So there is actually an inventory record on this one. Previous inventory indicates structure was built between 1910 and 1920. The tax rolls indicate, however, construction to be of 1930. The 1910 fire insurance plan shows a structure on the northwest two-thirds of the lot, which may still be a portion of the current structure. So from that inventory, we know the date is somewhere between 1910 and 1920, but possibly 1930, but only some of those may be there in 1910. So those are the sort of things that we're trying to figure through is, is any of that information accurate? And if so, what is accurate? Well, we can add to that 1930 date a 1936 date. Because we know from the newspaper that in June of 1936, Charles Jones was to build a warehouse at a cost of $3,500. A building permit, $3,500 for a warehouse on 2nd Avenue South has been taken out. It was further noted that Jones built the present Case Warehouse and Office. And this was the case building, it um, was international in case, or sorry, case at that time. So we have that 1936 date as well, and we have another date as well. So it looks like the building was actually, you know, there was an older building that has been gone and it was added to, so we have a few dates we have to go through. While we're still trying to figure out the exact date of this building, we know much more about the use of this site. Western Supply and Equipment Company had a warehouse at this corner from before the First World War and was located here until the early 1920s. For a time in the 1920s, there is actually a bit of a recession in the early 1920s in Southern Alberta. The building was vacant for a time. By the late 1920s, the J.I. Case machinery sales and Nash motor car sales are on this site. Arthur Balderson took over the management for Case and Nash in 1925. At that time, he had his office downtown in the Metcalf lot, but in 1928, he moved to the 1263 2nd Avenue South, and in addition to Case and Nash, he was also selling federal trucks. Now, Balderson seemed to have been quite the businessman, because not only was he selling those things, but in the 1930s and the Great Depression to try to keep everything going again, he was also selling radios from this site as well. Balderson continued to work for Case until the mid-1930s. Um, Charles E. Jones became the case dealer in 1936, taking over from Balderson. Jane, or sorry, Jones would work at Case until his own passing in 1940. Case remained at this site, though the business was later changed to the Lethbridge Farm Equipment Limited and remained here until the 1970s, until which time Case moves up into the industrial park. After Case moved out, this building has been home to various other types of enterprises, including Sanders Autoclass, Plain Limited, Vep Altair, Service Master, Sun Country Blind Clearance, 
And now, of course, the businesses that are now here, which of course is for City Barber Style and Lounge, theoretically brewing, and a photographer down the whole road that I can't see the sign. Anybody read it? There's the corner of the Is that Patterson? There's a question from Chris Spearman asking how long has that crack been on the sidewalk? Hmm? How long has that crack been on the sidewalk? How long has the crack been on the sidewalk? <laughs> Kelty said five years. Five years. <laughs> five years. Five years. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, it was Patterson. Okay. I know I've been in that park before. I love these buildings that have way more uses. So we are still trying to figure out exact date for this building. Though, as I said, we have a few clues as we go along. If we look across the street at Lester Preston Canvas, we have a much better sense of when that building was constructed. And from the records, that's a 1929 building. So we have across the street a building that's 92 years old. In March 1929, Waterloo Tractors announced that they were planning to build a warehouse here to handle distribution. Waterloo had been selling tractors and threshers and leftwich for two years prior, but recognizing the importance of this area, Southern Alberta, were now committed to the district by building a warehouse. It was, according to the reports from 1929, to be a completely new warehouse, which is why we believe we can give a 1929 date on that building. The building they constructed at that time, which has been added to and changed over the years, was 50 feet by 100 feet in size and was on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 12 East Street South. So that's how we have the history there. Now, one of the things about Waterloo tractors, there were two. There was the American Waterloo tractors, which was brought up by John Deere, and there was the Canadian Waterloo tractors, and this was the Canadian company located here in Lethbridge. As we know, of course, in the 1930s, the Great Depression, everything changes, and so does the use of this building. Dee Kennard, who had been the manager, opened here in 1929, opening on April uh, first of that year, but the building would only stay in use for Waterloo and for the next 32 years, or next 32 years, for the next three years until 1932. Waterloo sales fell, and instead of staying in their own building, they moved over into E.A. Sharman's store, which we'll find as we go a little further down, um, was on First Avenue South. This vacant fall, wow, trouble speaking to you. This building fell vacant for a time in the 1930s. But it was then taken over by D. McLeod and Sons Agricultural Implements. George Duncan McLeod was born in PEI, moved first to Saskatchewan, where in time he became an agent for International Harvester, and then he came to Lethbridge in 1931 and operated D. McLeod and Sons until 1947 when he retired. In 1955, he sold his business interest to his son William. Under his son William McLeod, the business remained here until the 1960s. Following the McLeods uh, leaving the building, Charleston Hill would be here in the building for the next decade or so to the 1970s. Charleston Hill was formed in 1941 by MF Malcolm Falwell Charleston and Clarence Leslie Pat Hill. From this site, Charleston Hill then moved up to the industrial area, and as we said, which will be true for a lot of other businesses. They were also located for a short time on 13th Street South before moving into this building. So they did spend some time in the warehouse district before moving up north. After Charleston and Hill left the building, they were followed by, in the building by McKellum Saddlery, Middle Earth Customizing, and then Pasteur's Custom Canvas. Pasteur's Custom Canvas started under Bill Pasteur in 1976. He had learned the business of working with canvas, working with his father, Klaus Pasteur, at Duhan Canvas, which of course is located in the Industrial Park. The company for Pasteur's Custom Canvas started making swather canvases, truck tarps, boat covers, bug screens, tents, and anything made of canvas. Ads for 1989 highlight that Lethbridge Custom Canvas, formerly Pasteur's Custom Canvas, was now located in the building. And from 1989 till today, Lethbridge Custom Canvas still finds that building cold. So we're going to head just across the street, talk about why there's a big empty parking lot, which I'm sure many of you know the story, and a little bit more along 2nd Avenue. probably picked up on some of the themes we've been talking about. When a business got big enough, they often moved up to the industrial park. The other theme that we're going to talk about quite a bit as we go through is actually fire. 
fire has dramatically changed and influenced the development of the warehouse district. I want you to imagine the warehouse district. I mean, we know we had a lot of tractors and agricultural implements. We also had oil and gas uh, storage in this area. As we go through, we're going to talk about how some of the places were about hay and alfalfa. We know from the mill from Ellison that they put in a um, sprinkler system very early on. There was industrial supplies and in the early days a lot of old wooden buildings. So you can imagine the dangers and risks in this area and we did see quite a few fires along this area. One of the more famous fires though was not one of the industrial places but across the street where the Lethbridge Arena sat. In January 1923, the Lethbridge Ice Arena opened on the site on the south side of 2nd Avenue. The rink originally had natural ice, but a modern ice plant was installed during a remodeling in 1937. When they did the remodeling in 1937, the seating capacity was increased from 1,800 to 3,000. The length of the ice was also expanded and the ice surface lowered to improve slope and create a better view for spectators. New dressing rooms as well as office space, coffee counter and new main entrance was built in 1930. The building was again remodeled in the 1960s. And about a decade after that remodeling, we'd lose the building. On 12 March 1971, during a hockey game between the Leopard Sugar Kings and the Edmonton Maple Leafs, a fire destroyed the old arena. 1,800 spectators had to be evacuated during the fire. The game was actually finished the next day um, in Tabor, but the building was completely lost on that night. Henderson Arena was built very quickly to replace the arena. Uh, and to this day, nothing has been built on the old site. Now, we're standing in front of 1251 2nd Avenue South, and if you actually see old buildings of the warehouse district, there were, for a long time, were agricultural implements parked here, because as we go down a little bit further, we'll come to the John Deere building. And so, if we know that there were a lot of times um, agricultural implements here in all of the old pictures, it shouldn't surprise us that this is a relatively new building at 1251. And this building dates from 1967. The need to construct this building actually came as a result of a fire, but not at this location, one block north. On May 1967, this building was open. Modern Farm Equipment was pleased to announce the opening of their brand new dealership building at 1251 2nd Avenue South. They had noted that they had to build this facility to serve people since the fire and were happy now to have a spacious new building for their cock shot farm equipment. So we know that um, just one block north, they were located, they had a fire, and they built this building. But they were stuck on this site before this building was built. On this site before this building was E.A. Sharman Agency. There was a small building here near the back of the lot in the pre-1955 time. Ernest A. Sharman was a large businessman. Among other business concerns, he had this implement dealership. He, all, he passed away in 1963, but his business here closed in the 1950s. Between his closing and this building being constructed, this was later the site of the Hurlburt Auction. It was on this site from the 1950s to 1961. Kenneth Earl, the Hurler Hurlburt, operated the auction. And of course, if that name sounds familiar to you, um, after, he clo or after he moved out of this site, he was later elected to House of Commons as a Member of Parliament in 1972. Modern farm equipment stayed on this spot in, from 1967 to the early 1970s, and then, of course, moved to the industrial park. After modern farm equipment moved out, this became Simpson Sears Warehouse, Herbert Floors, Engineered Homes, the wholesale heating supply. In the 1980s, Sanford Auto Parts moved in. They were into retail auto parts and accessories and operated here until the 1990s. The next thing we'll see on this spot are the MCC Variety Store, Mennonite Central Committee operated here, and now of course it is Kinetic Indoor Cycle and Fitness. So a building that's just over 50 years old, but has a long history. Long history on, um, on this site and this building as well. We're going to move down a little bit further to one of the oldest buildings on this site, the T.S. McKenzie Building, which no one will ever call the T.S. McKenzie Building because you'll all call it the John Deere Building.
nice thing about the history of this building is we know what's behind this facade. Well, not really a facade, but the cover. So both 1239 and 1245 were part of the John Deere. This is the original John Deere building. This building was constructed in 1911, so we're standing in front of a 110-year-old building. And it was built by T.S. McKenzie. In 1910, T.S. McKenzie purchased the business of Beaver & Sons, who were handling the Deering and McCormick Division of the International Harvester in a little wooden building just to the east of this building. Now, when T.S. McKenzie built this, he wanted to build it of the finest material, and he also wanted to build this building for... Oh, yeah, focus on the building, not me, because I want to point some things out. So he wanted to build this building for expansion, but he also wanted to build this building not only to be useful as a warehouse, but also to be an amazingly gorgeous building. So, the front of the building, all of the bricks on the front of the building are pressed brick that came from Redcliffe. Now, if you know anything about the bricks, Lethbridge had bricks, and there is Lethbridge brick in this building, but the Redcliffe and Medicine Hat bricks were considered a better quality than the Lethbridge brick. So he purposely used Redcliffe brick for the front, and that was all pressed brick from Redcliffe up front. The lintel, door, and window caps, and the sills and ornamentation in this building, he deliberately used Rocky Cooley gray stone which again was a very fine quality stone that he used in the building and you can see when you look at the windows there's amazing quality of that. All the other bricks, so if we go around to the side and the back, all other brick in this building were leopard brick that he used for everything else. When this building was constructed, 240,000 bricks and 150,000 feet of lumber was used. Now if you look at this building it is three stories tall but Mackenzie deliberately built this building of such a quality that two extra stories could be added if necessary. He was building to expand. And the way he did that, the walls from the ground to the floor of the top story are 20 inches thick in this building, and the walls of the top story are 14 inches thick. So he actually built the building deliberately that if anybody back in those days, I'm sure the standards have changed now, wanted to expand, this building was ready to go five stories tall. In this building, there are 12 feet high ceilings on the main floor and 9 foot high ceilings in the building, in the basement. The building also had, at the time it was constructed in 1911, a large electric elevator so items could be easily moved between the floors. And there were plenty of items to be moved. There was also a large platform and a private spur track that came up to this building. When the building opened, 80 carloads of machinery had to be unloaded. You can imagine how important it was to have the elevator. In addition to selling Deering products, Mackenzie also sold John Deere equipment, Cadillac automobiles, and the Brockville car from Ontario. This stayed as John Deere until the 1960s, when, of course, John Deere moved into the industrial park. After that, the two buildings, 1939 and 1245, had slightly different uses. 1239 then served as Common, common Co. Fertilizer, Fanny Fabrics, Oasis Sensorium, Chinook Wind and Surf. Strunuk Wind Surfing, 1245, uh, worked as Fanny Fabrics. So yeah, this is one of the most, one of the oldest and one of the more amazing buildings. It has still maintained its use. When we get to the corner, we're going to talk about a building that is equal in age to this one, but had a very interesting ha thing happen to it. So let's go to the corner and find out why this three-story building is still three stories and why that three-story building is no longer three stories. Second Avenue South, which is now the Idea Building, started its life as the Metals Limited Building. This warehouse was completed in November of 1910, so just prior to the T.S. McKenzie Building, and was built by Lucier Construction Company for Metals Limited of Calgary. Now you might wonder what Metals Limited was. 
Um, it was a wholesale business that served plumbing and steam fitters. The building was originally 50 feet by 170 feet, and as I mentioned earlier, this was originally a three-story building. Metals Limited stayed here for about five years, so during the First World War, they moved out. The next area, that, next business that comes in here, comes in here because of a fight between business owners. Just across the street was a business called Hyde and Saunders. Hyde and Saunders uh, were a hay and grain company. In 1916, Hyde and Saunders decided to split. Hyde stayed in that location, and Saunders moved right across the street to compete with his old business partner and developed this building into Saunders Hay and Grain Company. Now, if you've ever been around hay and grain, as I said earlier, fire hazards, and in March 1922, Saunders Hay and Grain suffered a terrible fire. Now, not only was there a lot of hay and grain here, things that are volatile and you know, flammable, but people had also been storing their furniture in this building, and the piano company had used some of the building to store pianos. All of that was lost when this fire, when this fire happened. Saunders Hay and Grain suffered heavy losses. The fire was caused from electrical problems in the building, faulty wiring on the third floor. So the main fire started in the third floor of this building. The first, the building was salvaged, as you can see, but they lost the third floor, and that was what they chose to do, was rather than rebuild the top floor, it was lost. And in 1922, this three-story building was redeveloped as the two-story building that you see today. After the fire, Saunders Hay and Grain decided to move out of this building, and the building next became home to the Southern Alberta Cooperative Association and the Southern Alberta Sheep Breeders Association. The cooperative would stay here for next several decades in this building, and if you look at a lot of historic buildings, that's what you'll see at that time. Of course, yeah, about 10-15 years ago, Idea Building opened up in this area. Across the street, we have another building that a lot of people will know a bit about, the Motor Car Supply Company. Motor Car, Motor Car Supply Company moved into Lethbridge in the 1930s. We were originally located down on 7th Street, just a little bit further south from the post office. They moved here in 1950 and constructed that building that we see across. All right, we need to go, for, we're not gonna continue on all the way. There's a lot more to talk about. Um, I wish we had the time tonight to go a little, couple blocks further south so that we could see the house that's still sticking uh, down there um, at the end, about 10th Street and uh, 2nd Avenue. But instead we're gonna go north and we're going to go talk about a shootout when the police, a police officer in this area almost got killed by burglars. And of course that happened in 1914. So let's go talk about the shootout of the warehouse system. Because the warehouse district often was known to have a lot of space and a lot of money put aside, there were, there were a few burglaries in this area. But this is the, the sh this shootout is the only time we know of where the almost police officer was almost killed. But we'll talk about it when we get to this point. A bit uneven ground. You can see where the old spur lines used to run, right? Someday we're going to do two tours and really quiet. But not the next one. <laughs> no, the next one's gonna be louder. You can feel 13 feet Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at 4 or 5 a.m. <laughs> I always, I'm always out by 5 a.m. doing photography. It's amazing <laughs> how quiet left which think it was, but you bump into people on the side. Yep. I. So imagine where the highway is right now would have been the rail yard. So if you see these warehouses along here, certainly they would have been right along the street. So, Someone asked where they could find more information about the remaining house on 2nd Avenue. But we will be talking about it. Okay. So I will mention it when we get a little further along. Um, and, and if they want information, they can always contact the Lethbridge Historical Site. We can provide more information. So 1216 First Avenue South 
is where we have the shootout of 1914. And when we look at that shootout of June 1914, the newspaper at the time had two questions. First, did Lethbridge police officers refuse to obey orders? And who were the burglars and why did they fire on police? These are some of the questions that were asked after the June 1914 shootout between burglars and the police outside the Western Canada Agency. Now, in the first write-up in the newspaper, Sergeant Bowker was riding his bike down First Avenue South when he heard a noise at the Canada, a Western Canada Agency. He pulled over his bike, went to the fence, and raised his head over the fence. As soon as he did, shots rang out, barely missing him. A man crouched behind the fence started shooting at Bowker when another man also started firing, but Bowker was able to duck behind a stone wall. He was fortunate that he did as the first man jumped over the fence and fired once again at him. As the sergeant took shelter, the two men ran off. Constable Holberton, who was out patrolling, arrived shortly on scene, but he and Bowker were unable to capture the men. Chief Skelton was notified and arrived with ten more men. One officer was left behind to guard the store until the morning. The next morning it was discovered that Lethbridge Laundry, which had been was on 6th Avenue South at that time, had been robbed and that people, burglars, had been attempting to break into the safe here when Bowker had surprised them, preventing the second robbery. That's how the story was, de uh, was described first in the Lethbridge Herald. But it soon came out that there was a lot more to it. Holberton and another constable, Dooley, were both dismissed from the Lethbridge Police Service for neglect of duty, cowardice, and disobedience of orders. Because Bowker was not just riding his bike along, he had actually um, tried to get a plan in place. Holberton, it seems, had observed two men enter the yard adjacent to the warehouse and had informed Sergeant Bowker. Bowker had sent Holberton to a specific location and was told to signal Bowker when he reached it. Dooley was sent to wait at the lane at 12th Street North for development. When the burglars ran after Bowker confronted them, Holberton and Dooley were supposed to be in the perfect position to catch the two men. The plan did not go as it was supposed to. When they heard shots fired and thought that Bowker could have been hurt, the two men abandoned their post and ran around to the front of the building, thus permitting the burglars to escape right past where Holberton and Dooley were supposed to be standing. And for that, they were fired from the Lethbridge Police Service. That building, of course, later became uh, Top Hat, and now, of course, we see it behind us today. We're going to move a little bit further south, uh, further east, and talk about a house that was knocked down. That was the house of one of Lethbridge's more famous, um, more fa oh, sorry. We're going to get the uh, Plunkett and Savage first, and then we'll talk about the house. Let's go a block further west. The funny thing about that shootout in 1914, they mentioned it was the first shootout since the new chief had been elected or chosen for police. But he'd only been in police for a year. So they were proud of the first shootout in a year. I don't know why people think left, which was calm back then. In 1912, a police officer was shot right on Main Street left. No. He did survive. Still shot though. He's still shot though, yeah. <laughs> I like buildings that have ghost signs so that you know which one you're going to. Right? Dominion crew is still on the building. Mm -hmm. And I'll read the ghost sign over the name over the door, which still has Dominion crew too. and Savage, which were the names of the owners, were wholesale fruit and produce merchants who, by 1913, had operations in Calgary, Edmonton, and Lethbridge. In Lethbridge, the company was located at 212 4th Street South. Remember I said 4th Street was the older warehouse district, and that's where they were located in the early years remaining there for decades. Plunkett's and Savage was eventually bought out by the Dominion Fruit Company, 
though they kept the Plunkett and Savage name for several years. In the 1940s, the boom after the Second World War, Plunkett and Savage determined that a larger warehouse was needed. This building was constructed in 1948. The warehouse was designed with functional modern design with a modest Art Deco design influences. The building was constructed I always hate when I have to pause on turning with multiple loading bays with a heavy timber structure that would support the heavy loads of the warehouse. By the 1970s, Dominion Fruit Company was being used as the name of the building and business and they had abandoned the Plunkett and Savage name. So that means the Dominion Fruit name was not on this building prior to the 1970s. In 1981, it was announced that Dominion Fruit was to close this warehouse. The building stood empty for quite a few years, but of course has since undergone major renovations and is still back and is now again in active use. And you can see the businesses that are in there. Beautiful building, Dominion Fruit Company building. Don't you just see so many possibilities in some of these buildings? Let's go down and find out now, as I said, which famous artist lived on this street and why his house was knocked down. Chances are it was to build a warehouse. Probably not a surprise to any of you, right? I, you know, they might not have seen me pointing, but I've been trying to document all the sidewalk stamps. So we have to walk back this way after the tour so I can get this one. So in the early days, remember that the warehouse district is actually west of downtown. So as I said, around 4th Street. So this area, what was it at this time? Well, at one time there was only one railway track. The rail yards hadn't really expanded yet. And this was a residential area, it shouldn't be surprising. Third Avenue South was actually one of the residential areas that had some of the largest and grandest houses built in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And there were houses on 2nd Avenue and here on 1st as well. And there was, at this spot here at 1016 1st Avenue South, one of the grander homes in Lethbridge at that time. When this warehouse was built, that house was then knocked down. And they knocked down to build this an 1897 house. It was built on this site for a man named T.L. Naismith, who was the general manager of the Alberta Railway and Irrigation Company. And if you look at the 1906 coal mine strike, if you look at a lot of that early history connected to the Galt Company, T.L. Naismith's name will come up a lot. So Naismith lived in a house here um, from 1897 until he quit with the business. After Naismith, S.G. Porter, the next general manager, resided here in this building. When the Canadian Pacific Railway took over the Galt Company, took over Alberta Railway and Irrigation Company, Porter then became the superintendent of the CPR irrigation system and continued to reside here. And this house became the official home for the superintendent and he in time was followed by a man named Gavin Houston and then Major Frederick George Cross. Frederick George Cross, in addition to his work for the CPR, gained an international reputation as a watercolorist and painter. His paintings showed the open range, foothills, and the mountains of southern Alberta, and he also showcased the cattle and horses and the drought-ridden farmlands of the Great Depression era of this place. If you actually look up George Frederick, Frederick George Cross online, 
you will see some amazing paintings. One of his most famous paintings, uh, which he painted in 1938 when he was living in this place, was actually called the Horse Barn. Now we do know that he did not paint the horse barn at his residence. He actually painted it in the CPR home barn here in Lethbridge. And in order to paint it with the horses actually in the building, the horses were used every day. So he actually did all the painting in the middle of the night. He went down to the horse barns and painted there. Uh, Frost lived in Lethbridge until 1941 when he passed away. And he is buried in Mountain View Cemetery. Seven years after his passing, the house was knocked down and the warehouse was constructed. The warehouse was constructed for Ashdown Hardware. Ashdown Hardware was at that time operating Hicks Hardware here in Lethbridge and they constructed on this site a hardware store, a warehouse, 150 feet by 150, 115 feet by 150 feet in this one story warehouse. Ashdown Hardware remained here until about 1960. The building then served Can West Seed, Atlas Agent, Midwest Paper, United Grain Growers, Packard Medical, Otis Elevator, and Railway Furniture. Of course, many of you will know what came after all of those buildings, which was a series of nightclubs, Cook Country Saloon, Rebels Roadhouse, Thurston Grill, Pulse Nightclub, and then the supervised consumption site. This building and this site have had a long history. Now, we're gonna go up to the next corner and I'm going to talk about, I don't think we'll be able to see, the uh, one house that still remains in the warehouse district on 2nd Avenue South. So we'll go up to the next corner and talk about that. Someone mentioned that the first doctor in Lethbridge came in 1886 and his house is on 3rd Avenue. Dr. Mewburn's house, definitely, yeah. Turn, um, that one became a funeral home, I believe. Okay, we always found this last name when a doctor's home becomes a funeral home. Yeah, Egan Botham had his house on 3rd Avenue uh, and a few other of the more better known names of those early years. It wasn't until 3rd Avenue took on the more of a highway and we really start seeing it from change completely from residential to what we have today. It's interesting as we see the uses. One of the things every community, and we see it a lot in Leverage, is the competing interests. Um, a lot of places that were residential then become commercial or we see residential moving into areas that used to be industrial because of course there's only so much space and people are jostling for it and so those uses get moved around consistently. It is interesting that Ellison Mills, right, one of the first industries built in Lethbridge still remains in what now is very much a commercial area, not an industrial area. But it just shows how long it has been on this place. see the blue roof of what used to be the Napa building and it's just a little bit to the um, east of Napa. It's actually was used as a um, storage shed and that's 1,006 1, 2nd Avenue South. And as I said there were a few houses in this area. At one time if you look at the map they're all right there beside each other but only 1,006 still survives. That house is 115 years old. It was built in 1906. We know some of the people who lived in there. And interestingly, that house has a lot of connection to Ellison Mills. In 1914, Mabel DeGlow, who was a stenographer at Ellison's, lived in that building. By 1920, it's the home of Irving Fraser, a brakeman for the CPR. And throughout many, many of the years of the 1930s and 1940s, it was the home of George N. Green, who of course was a clerk with Ellison Milling. The Green family and the Ellison family, of course, uh, connected with Ellison Mill for a very long time. Uh, George W. Green also had Green Mills, Green Star Mill, which was just a little bit further um, east of Ellison Mills and then of course taken into the Ellison Mills compound. By the 1950s, Roy A. Nado, um, who was a contractor for the PFRA, was in that building. Um, yeah, it is interesting that building, I have not had a much chance to look around because of course it's a storage building. No longer used as a house, but it is the last house remaining on 2nd Avenue South in the warehouse district. So it gives us a hint of what this area was before we start to see the warehouses move in. And for a long time, the houses and the warehouse district sort of competed together, which makes sense because of course, people could not or did not want to go as far to work back then. So having a house right there, especially if you were working at Ellison Mill, 
How incredibly convenient would that be? Last building we're just going to mention, the Long and McQuaid building. Uh, this building is from about 1945, based on what we've been able to find so far. And it was the Southern Alberta Sheep Breeders and then the Canadian Co Cooperative Wool Growers. Yeah. Again, similar organization throughout its time. And that is where the, um, the wool growers were located until so they moved out east of town. I don't know about you guys, but we raised sheep. There was always the coolest things in there to buy. Oh, did you guys ever go to Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers? Oh, you guys missed out on really cool stuff. You have to go check them out where they are east of town. Very fun stuff. Of course, now long in the place. So that is our short introduction to the warehouse district. We're continuing to research. If you have stories of this district that you can share with us, you've got our Facebook. You can always email them to the Historical Society. You can find our email. It's info at leftridgehistory.org. Uh, contact us. Help us tell better stories of the warehouse district. We want to continue to add. We do have more stories. We have stories on more buildings in this area, but we want to continue to grow it. And as I said, now the heart of our city is expanding in this area. Maybe some of these buildings can get plaques and we can continue to develop and tell more stories of the warehouse district. Um, this will be our tour for tonight, but join us in two weeks, July 8th. We will be starting similar to where we started today, just a little bit further north, and we'll be doing 13th Street North and telling the story of the North Ward's main streets and all the stories we can of the old Westminster Road in the north side of Lethbridge. Thank you all, and we'll see you in two weeks.